Amen. If you have your Bibles with you this morning, we ask you to turn to the book of Exodus, Exodus chapter 8, uh, verse 10. Exodus chapter 8 and verse 10. The Bible says, and he, meaning Moses, and he said tomorrow, and he said, be it according to thy word, that thou mayest know there is none like unto the Lord our God. Let's pray. Dear Lord, we thank you and we praise you. Lord, this morning we pray that we might see you in how magnificent and how glorious you really are. Lord, that we never be able to see your power and your grace in all things. God, help us to be a group that would follow you. We pray these things in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Now, uh, some fairly familiar verses of Scripture, and this is just one text, and we'll go to other places. But... Uh, in the kind of in the middle or toward the end, maybe three fourths the way through of the plagues brought against Israel, uh, we find the purpose of the plagues. There's always a purpose to a blessing, and there's always a purpose to a downfall. Uh, now the devil would hoodwink you and to believe that the downfalls is a, uh, to knock you down so you'll never get up again. Uh, but if that were to be so, then our God is not sovereign after all. He is under the uh, ability to be attacked by Satan, and we know that's not true. Now, in verse 10, it says, And he said, Tomorrow. Now, uh, until the Lord comes again, the glorious thing, there's always tomorrow. Now, things may look very, very bleak today, but blessed be the name of the Lord unless the end time comes, tomorrow's coming. Tomorrow's going to be brighter. In the darkest part of the night when you can see nothing else, the sun will rise again tomorrow and dispel all the darkness that you now see. Now, in the very same way, the, the problem that you're experiencing, even if it's a lost condition and you can't see the person of Christ for the blackness that overwhelms you, tomorrow is coming. The sun will rise again and all will be well. And so as Moses is addressing Pharaoh, now remember, uh, the best I can understand about his disposition, he never really changed one bit. He moved on fear. And finally, when his son died, he said, let him go. And they hadn't even got out of the city good yet. And he says, no, we're going to stop him. And so a lost person, he's saying to, you're going to see my God. That's an amazing thing, is it not? That, that's why the elect, that's why those that are damned from eternity past can't say, I never knew what you were talking about, because even the trees dispel there is a God. Mm -hmm. and, and so we find as uh, Moses approaches a sinful man, a man condemned already to die, he says, tomorrow, and he, and he said, be it according to to thy word that thou mayest know there is none like unto the Lord our God. Now, I don't know what you're facing this morning, but I do know this, there's none like unto our God. There's none so great, there's none so glorious, there's none so high and lifted up as our God is. There's none... Uh, <laughs> Uh, and, and, you know, the flesh being what it is, we miss that frequently. Uh, even as the sun approaches another day, we don't realize how glorified God is in that. You know what? Because we get used to it. We anticipate it. It's always rose, so it'll rise again. No, it rises on the decree of the Almighty. 
That, that's why time is. And so as, uh, as Moses is addressing this lost man, he says, I, I'll let you know you're going to see something tomorrow that displays the character and the person of our God. Now, all through the ministry of Christ and all through your lifetime and all through my lifetime, I've seen time and time and time again where God displayed himself just as he said he would. Now, it might not be the way that you wished it was, but he still says, I'm God. He still says, I am whom I say that you, I am. Now, if you will go with me to the Gospel of Luke, uh, Luke chapter 8, and we're going to look at a couple of these manifestations uh, that God is there. Luke chapter 8 and uh, verse 43. Luke chapter 8 and uh, verse 43. Now, I don't know if you're going to uh, look on what I'm going to say as good news or of... Uh, uh, bad news but uh, this is the situation this morning uh, you're going to die Man, that's it uh, you'll fail, I'm sorry go to Luke 7 first Luke 7 verse 11 but um, that's unavoidable uh, unless the Lord comes in his brightness while we live and the redeemed go up uh, you're facing death just as sure as uh, the patient in the hospital dying of cancer this morning. It's coming just as assuredly to you as it is to them. Yeah. Now, at least in man's eyes, it's coming quicker to them, but in reality, we do not know that. No. Uh, uh, in reality, it may get me before it gets you, and it may get... Uh, some of you younger people before it gets me. That's why we're to be prepared always because you just never know. Gospel of Luke chapter 7 verse 11. The Gospel of Luke chapter 7 uh, verse 11. The Bible says this, And it came to pass the day after, that that he said unto us that he went unto a city called Nain, and there and many of his disciples went with him, and much people. Now, what had just happened is that God had, I mean, the Lord Jesus had performed a great miracle, and a lot of people started following, not because they loved Christ, but because they loved the miracle. Now, you, you ever wonder why Pentecostalism is, is, taking, uh, is taking such hold? That's why. It feels good to the flesh, and they get to see something. Amen. And that, that's why it's growing, and the Lord's churches are shrinking, and that is the difference. See, uh, whether we want to accept it or not, religion feels good to the flesh, doesn't it? Mm -hmm. I'm not saying Christ, and I'm not saying uh, the gospel feels good to the flesh. I'm saying religion feels good to the flesh. You can go into every, every heathen nation there is, and you'll, you'll scrap up some type of religion, right. but you won't scrap up the gospel. And, and, and so we find that uh, it sounded so good, and it was so amazing that, his, that he had increased his band of followers. Now in verse 11, they went into this, this teeny tiny town of Nain. Now, I don't know nothing about it. I've read that it was so small, it's about like Carlisle is. Just a handful of people uh, living in close proximity. In other words, he didn't go there to make a wide testimony. You know, uh, it takes a man that loves God to go where there's two or three people, doesn't it? Uh, it, it takes a man that is close unto the Lord not to want the limelight. And, and so we find he goes to this tiny city, and probably the followers that came with him was more than what the city really consisted of, and he goes to this tiny little place. Aren't you blessed and happy this morning? He went to that tiny little place where the Lord saved your soul. Because that's what it takes. And so he came to Nain, verse 12, 
Uh, now when they were come nigh to the gate of the city, behold, there was a dead man carried out, the only son of his mother, and she was a widow, and much people of the city was with her. Now, I want you to, to understand what's occurring here, because we, we miss it in the modern era. Not only was the gig up for the young man, the gig was up for mama too. Because, see, uh, she couldn't go on welfare, and she couldn't go on Social Security. She couldn't go on any of those programs because they did not exist. And in Jewish law, her only hope was that her neighbors might give her something to eat. That was her only hope. And that boy, apparently a young man, died untimely and was going off to be carried to the graveyard. Now, if I understand the Jewish culture like, like, like I think I do, say if I died tomorrow, today, by tomorrow night, they had to get me in the ground. That was their thing, that the next sunset, they had to be in the ground. And, and, and so, uh, you know, or, or, and I, I want something a little bit different for my burial. Uh, I want y'all to take me out here uh, uh, the next morning and just do it. But today we have a long time to prepare. Uh, Anglins was booked back up when Mother died, and she died on a Sunday, and we didn't bury her to Thursday because it wasn't. <laughs> she had to wait in line, as those saying goes. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, so we, uh, but it was an immediate thing. Death happened in period of uh, In other words, there was no preparatory grief. And so this devastated woman buries her son in the next day without any kind of means at all. But we don't get that, do we? We don't understand that. And, and, and so we find not only was the grief of losing a child, the fear that comes with knowing not how you're ever going to get your next meal. That's what this woman was experiencing. And when the Lord saw her, meaning the woman, meaning the woman with uncertainty, meaning the woman that, that was going toward starvation, when he saw her, he had compassion on her and said unto her, Weep not. Now, I tell you what, that's a tall bill to fill. Amen. Now, uh, men are less emotional than women, and I guess that's just how God created us. And sadly to say, I'm probably less emotional now than when I was young, and I don't know why that is. Uh, one of the girls I work with said, Larry, you should uh, be an ICU nurse. And I said, I don't like ICU. Why would you say that? She says, nothing bothers you. Uh, so I wasn't sure how to take that. If that was a compliment or she was saying I was careless. Uh, uh, but a woman and a, man, and a man just react differently to death. They just do. Now, Lord, being my helper, I hope I never bury a child. But I think it would break me. But I know it would break her worse. And that's just the nature of a woman. So he's seen her. Not only that she's going to starve, he saw how broken she was. And he made this unbelievable command, weep not. Now, sisters, if you were bearing a child, what kind of command is that to be? <coughs> I would say it's impossible, wouldn't you? I, I would say it was nigh to not happening. See, that, that's, that's our attitude many times when it comes to miracles is that we, that we stick in the here and the now and we forget how powerful our God 
is. We forget his ability is beyond our understanding. We forget that he's the one that says, peace be still. We forget how great and mighty he is. And the devil then has a great victory. And he, he, he knocks us down and stamps on us and stomps on us because we forget we serve the living God of heaven. And there's nothing to go under his dominion. And so this woman was given this command. And he came and he touched the bear that, and they that bear him stood still. And he said, young man, I say unto thee, arise. And he that was dead sat up and began to speak and, that, and he delivered him to his mother. Now, what a wonderful, wonderful thing that God is able to do this for us. I think another accounting of this gospel uh, actually says uh, they laughed at him. Uh, you know what? People laugh at you all the time. You know, why do they waste one of their weekend days and go spend a whole day at church? They're laughing at you. But one day that will come to a stop. It will come to a stop because he'll call us out. Now, can you imagine someone already on their way to the grave? Uh, just say that... Uh, we can't say Herman anymore because he's, he's gone, but just say Wayne was already pulling out and taking you to the Hildreth at the cemetery over there at home. And someone would say, you know, Wayne, stop. I've got to interrupt things. And open the door of the, her the door, back door of the hearse and say, come out of there. See, that's what our God can do. That's what he's able to accomplish. And you know what? There's no less miracle than when he saves somebody. Right. He says, I've called you from death unto life. Right. <laughs> and, and, and it's equally amazing. We serve a God wherein we have no need whatsoever to worry or to stress or to get upset because he is still on the throne. Now, notice, uh, drop down, uh, uh, drop down to uh, verse 43. Same chapter. This chapter is full of his miracles. Uh, I'm sorry. 8.43. Luke, Luke 8.43. Luke 8.43. Now, if you're familiar with your Bible, you know that uh, he had been sought after and uh, a man came and said, my daughter is dying. Yeah. Now, that's serious business, is it not? When uh, the love of a, of a family for their children, there's nothing like it. There's nothing like it. You, you, you literally will do anything for them. And everybody says, well, once I get them out of the house, no, no, it don't stop there. In fact, uh, I think you're more tend to do it because you're like, you know, they're out there on their own and I, I don't know if they can do it. And, and you know, uh, then you want to do more, right? And, and, and so we find this girl is on her deathbed and she, she's not on the death and, and her daddy, a centurion, went to see if, God, if the Lord Jesus would come and help him. You know, have you ever wondered and how many times you've taken something uh, before the Lord? Because see, that's what this centurion was doing. He was taking something, the death, of, well really the sickness, she didn't die yet, the sickness and the dire situation before the Lord. Uh, remember the, the uh, uh, ruler of Israel? When he went up on, he went up into the, he went down to the Lord's house and laid the problems out before the Lord. Right. See, we need to be more faithful in that, mm -hmm. do we not? Mm -hmm. 
You, you know what that is? It, it, it's nothing miraculous about that, but it shows your faith. That, that, that's what it does. It shows I'm confident that my Lord is able Amen. to do this. I, I, I'm certain that he can get the job done. And, and so we find that that was the situation with this man, and he went before him, and he said, I'll come and help you. You know, what, what a glorious thing when the Lord Jesus says, I'll come and help you. <laughs> he, he says, I'm on my way. I, I, I'm, I'm coming in that direction. Uh, but in the flesh at that time, see, the Lord Jesus was wearing a flesh. The Bible says it's uh, like like in the sinful man. I don't believe he. I, I don't believe he was capable of sin. Uh, so that, I believe that's why the Bible says like unto sinful man. I don't believe he was just like us. <laughs> uh, but he couldn't just boom and be down. In other words, if he wanted to, he could just pop up over there. Uh, but he had to walk through the crowd. You know what? It may be a delay and some interruptions along the way, but the answer's coming. The answer's coming. It, 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 it may take a little time and it, it may take a, a, a little patience on your part, but the answer is coming. And, and so with that said, they, they are there and uh, they're on, the, on their way to, John, uh, uh, to Jairus' house. Verse 43. And a woman having an issue of blood... 12 years, which had spent all her living upon physician, neither be healed of any. Now here, we always, when sickness, when sickness pops up, we go to the doctor. And nothing wrong with that, but you know what has taught us that as our first option is our culture. Uh, just you know, you sick, you go to the doctor. Uh, had been always that way. The majority of the time growing up, we didn't even have a vehicle. And I, I remember this, and it'd be like setting you on fire. If I got, and, and now looking back, I'm sure I had pneumonia multiple times that mother didn't know about, just, you know, coughing up ungodly stuff. And she would uh, take solstice. That, I mean, it's just like fire, just rubbing fire on you. And then she'd heat it on the stove and on a rag and slam it on your chest and, I mean, set you on fire. But uh, she did what she knew to do. See, we didn't run to the doctor. That's a long trip to Dover back then. And you had to hire somebody to take you. Mm -hmm. So that's more of the environment. But this woman had spent probably doing things like that all along the way. And the Bible said it didn't work. She, in fact, was nothing the better. You know what? If, if we don't depend on God, you can give everything you have to a problem, but it does not mean it'll work out. You know why? Because you're doing it in the flesh. You're, you're, you're doing it, uh, you're doing it uh, in the energy of the flesh, in, in the way that man thinks. And so she went through all this. She went through her money. She went through the end the energy of it, and 12 years later, she's in the same condition, and I believe the Gospel of Matthew says, but rather grew worse, and, and got, uh, in other words, went further down the hill. Verse 44, came behind him, meaning the woman, and touched the border of his garment, and immediately her issue of blood was staunched or stopped. And Jesus said, who touched me? Now, he knew. He, he just wanted everybody else to know. And uh, uh, isn't it a wonderful thing? And if you know anything about praying at all, when you finally touch Jesus. Now, we all know about going through a little routine and a haphazard prayer, but when you get down to the nitty-gritty and know that you've touched the hem of the garment, that's a huge difference, is it not? That's when you know, listen, if you get something good or if you don't get something good, it's the will of the Almighty and you're glad of it. And, and so she touched the hem of the garment. Jesus said, who touched me? When all denied Peter 
and, and when all denied, Peter and they that were with him said, Master, the multitude thronged thee and pressed thee. Sayest, who, sayest thou who touched me? And Jesus said, Somebody have touched me, for I have perceived that virtue is gone out of me gone out of me. Now, that's the difference between a Mickey Mouse prayer and a prayer that gets a hold of God, is virtue. And that, that just, that's a word that just means goodness of character, goodness of character. And it's gone out of it. You know what? Every prayer don't encapsulate that, does it? But sometimes they do. Sometimes you get a hold of the throne. And the, the virtue went out. The healing went out. And we see this uh, uh, a miraculous event. And she, she finally confessed it was me. And the Lord Jesus got the glory. Uh, that's what we understand. She uh, was completely healed. The, I think uh, the Gospel of Matthew said that she was healed with the issue of her blood. And she, and, and she praised him. Now, that is a miraculous thing. Now, uh, I don't know what this woman had, what kind of disease or ailment, but every time I read this, uh, I think of leukemia. Now, unless it just booms suddenly, and as some people get elderly in their 90s, it, it very quickly happens. But I've been taking care of a patient who's also a physician himself that uh, has a type of leukemia. And he said, Larry, it's a slow, so kill, a slow, slow killer, yeah. but it will get you. Yeah. And, and that was pretty profound to me. So maybe this woman had leukemia. She'd been de dealing with it 12 years. And you know what? It's just about to get her. You know what? Sin will do the very same thing. You can live in it and live in it. It will impact you. And you know what? Without the grace and intervention of God, it eventually gets you. It, it eventually takes you down. And, and so we find that this woman is miraculously healed, but at least, uh, at least in man's eye, it slowed Christ down. You know what? A good news this morning, Christ never gets slowed down. Nothing ever gets in his way. Nothing ever, uh, nothing ever falls outside his plan. He's always, always right on time. And so we find that this may have upset some, this little sidestep he had to take for, the, for this woman. Down to verse 49. And while he yet spake, and what he said is go in peace. And while he yet spake, there cometh one from the ruler of the synagogue's house, saying to him, Thy daughter is dead. Trouble not the master. Now, I, I don't know what your situation is this morning, but I want to give you the opposite advice, and you trouble the master. You worrying to death. You keep going back to him time and time and time and time again. See, I, I'm sure this servant meant well, but that's the worst advice that he could have given. Don't trouble the master. You know what? As long as there's life, there's hope. Amen. Trouble him to death. Amen. Worry. So, gee, you know, that's what happened. Uh, I'm trying to think. It was in the days of the king, of the kings, and... There was a woman that came and came and came, and she finally, he finally said, just do it. She's worrying me to death. Just do it. You know, that, that's the kind of prayer, prayer person I want to be. I'm not always there, but that's what I want to be. Just worry him to death. Mm -hmm. and, and, and so we, uh, we find that this woman, I mean, we find that this advice from this man was not good advice. He said, don't trouble him. It's over with. It's done. It, it, it's no longer necessary. Verse 50. But when Jesus heard it, he answered him saying, Fear not. And remember, the widow of Nain had just went through what she did. Now we find another dead child. Fear not. Believe only. And she shall be made whole. Now, 
What when we, and, and I've noticed this more and more over the last year, some of the best advice that the Bible gives us and, 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 and improving your faith is this, don't fear. Don't you fear it will destroy your faith. Fear not, believe only. Now, that's easy to preach and harder to do when you've got a child dead back at the house, isn't it? Fear not. Believe only. You know, uh, there, you know, Brother Jerry was saying something about it. This life is not a pleasant, easy life to live, is it? Being a Christian, a true Christian, listen, it's not somersaults and jumping jacks. It's rough stuff. Uh, in fact, the Lord Jesus said, <laughs> Your mama will leave you. Your daddy will leave you. Your brother will leave you. Your children will leave you. Amen. He says, if you want to pick up your cross and call, uh, follow me, you can. But this is how it is. Ye are pilgrims and strangers. Don't settle down. This world is not my home. I'm just passing through. All right. And, and so we find then that uh, the Lord Jesus asked an unbelievable task. He says, fear not. Believe only. <laughs> and she shall be made whole. And when he came into the house, he suffered no man to go in, save Peter, James, and John, and the father and the mother of the maiden. Now, I'm not sure. I think the significance of that being a maiden, uh, she was probably 14 or above. Uh, you're not talking a, a small child like Bella. You're talking more somebody, uh, you know, probably 16, 17. And she's laying there. She's dead. Uh, looks like there's no hope. And all wet. Well, and let me say one more thing about 51 and we'll go on. Uh, you got to be in close proximity to see a miracle. The three beloved apostles, the inner circle, her mom and her daddy, and that was it. <laughs> uh, to see a miracle, you have to be close to the problem. We want to see one from way out here, don't we? I don't think you'll ever do it. You, you have to see right there in it. You ever think about the feeding of the 5,000? You don't know how that was structured. Yeah. A boy's lunch. God bless, the Lord Jesus blessed it. And what did he do? He said he broke it and blessed it and gave to his apostles and they took it to them. Now, the Bible says concerning that miracle, there were 5,000 men fed beside women and children. So you think about that mob of un unbelievable amount of people. You know what? They all didn't see what was going on down there. They got it through somebody else. And that was good, man. They got a they got a fish a fish dinner, but they didn't know the origin. You know who knew the origin? That little boy, the apostles, and Jesus. Close proximity. Yeah. You you need to be in close proximity. You know where we spend the majority of our time way out here when we need to be right here. Yes, amen. Amen. We need to be right here. And, and, and so we find. Everybody else is pushed aside. Uh, the famous Jewish lamentations about how they carry on when somebody died and uh, uh, grieving on her. They begin all that. And then notice what happens in 52. And all wept and bewailed her. But he said, weep not. This is, uh, she's not dead, but sleepeth. And they laughed him to scorn, knowing she was dead. You know, uh, uh, you know, uh, you're going to be laughed to scorn. Uh, if you eat up with cancer from the top of your head to the bottom of your feet, and you come down here and ask for an anointing, you're going to be laughed to scorn. But it doesn't matter, does it? Doesn't matter a bit. 
Uh, have faith and believe. You know, I, I fully believe this. What's wrong with the Lord's churches today is they lack faith. Amen. Well, when, uh, when the apostles was having trouble with that one demon, devil, he said, why can we not cast him out? Because you have no faith. If you have the faith as a grain of mustard seed. Amen. We need that, don't we? You want to see how miraculous our God is? We desperately, desperately need that. And, and, and so we find that they're <laughs> being made fun of essentially because of their faith. Verse 54, And he put them all out and took her by the hand and uh, called, saying, Maid, arise. And her spirit came again, and she arose straightway, and he, and he commanded to give her meat. And her parents were astonished. But he charged them that they should tell no man what was done. Now, um, I want you to see two things. First of all, they had, uh, you, you know, one accounting of this, I guess it's in the Gospel of Matthew, when, when the Father said, Lord, I believe. Help my unbelief. And so when they got up there, in that condition, when it actually happened, it says they were astonished. <laughs> you know what? I want to stand close enough to Christ sometime and see something so miraculous, I stand there astonished. Yeah. That, that's a wonderful miracle, is it not? Yeah. Yeah. That's a glorious thing. But see, you've got to be in the nitty-gritty to enjoy it. You gotta you gotta be in a hard, hard spot to see God move that way. And largely in the modern day, we don't want nothing of it. That's why the feel-good stuff is so easy, because it doesn't require much for it. Last place, and I'm gonna let you. We're going to dismiss the Gospel of Mark. Again, familiar verses of Scripture, seeing the Lord Jesus Christ lifted up for who He is. The Gospel of Mark chapter 4. Mark chapter 4. And begin reading in verse 35. Mark chapter 4, uh, verse 35. The Bible says this, And the same day... Uh, and that was when he gave them the parable of the seed. And the same day when even was come, he saith unto them, Let us pass into the other side, putting them directly in the path of the storm. And when they had sent, and when they had sent the multitude away, took him, even as he was in the ship, and there were also with them other little ships, people that could see from a distance, the little ships, Jesus' ship here, the little ships out here, going across to the other side. And there arose a, a great storm of wind, and the waves beat into the ship. Now, it doesn't say it beat into the little ships, it said it beat into their ship. So that it was now full. It, singular, was now full. You know what? Not only did he put them in the, the midst of the storm, if I understand this for what it truly says, they were the only ones going down. Uh, the distance people were okay. <laughs> you know what? You live a distance life and it's going to be okay, but you ain't going to see anything good. <laughs> and uh, so they're, they're on their way. Verse 38. And he, meaning Christ, was in the hinder part of the ship, asleep on a pillow. And they awake him and said unto him, Master, carest thou not that we perish? And he arose and rebuked the wind and said unto the sea, Peace be still. And the wind ceased, and there was great calm. And he said unto them, Why are you so fearful? Remember, be not afraid. And why are you so fearful? How is it that you have no faith? And they feared exceedingly and said one to another, What manner of man is this, that even the wind and the sea 
obey him. Now, that's that's the God we serve. That's the Lord Jesus Christ. That's the great God, Jehovah. And you know what? I want to be down to the nitty gritty. And you know what? It's easy to ask for when things are going good, but when the cupboard's bare, that's a totally different thing, is it not? But I'll, even when the cupboard's bare, I want to see it. Uh, Satan has wreaked havoc on Jared's house. You hang in there. It's a, it, it's a rough, rough time. Yeah. Don't let that boy go out of your prayers. Right. Yeah. But you'll see something great in that. The storm's here. Mm-hmm. You'll see something good in that. Amen. I don't know what it'll be. It may not even be what we think it ought to be. But something good will be. Uh, he'll come along and say, peace be still. Mm-hmm. Because you know what? He has, a, he has authority over that. He has authority over all. So if, if the weather gets rough, just remember this. Two words. Peace be still. It was done. It was over with. But he had, them boys had to see the storm first. Peace be still wouldn't have meant a whole lot on a smooth sailing sea, would it? But it meant a whole lot in the storm. 